Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 31 of your favorite YouTube series. It's our favorite YouTube series, too, mostly because we're in it, but also, you know, because uh, we, we talk about cool stuff, but, uh, you know, we're like that. So um, I have Anthony and Lloyd with me, as always, of course, your, uh, your, your friends at the Really Bad Security Crew. And this week, we are going to be talking with Todd Adams and Daniel Floyd from Black Cloak. And uh, for anyone that doesn't know, um, Black Cloak is, we're going to talk about protecting um, your, your executives and a, a very interesting take on protecting your executives. So we're super excited about um, this episode because, again, you know, we love bringing new stuff to, uh, to, to the audience. And I think we're going to have a great time with this one. So... Um, Daniel, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to throw you the easiest question, hopefully that you'll get all day, and then um, you can introduce yourself and answer that question, and then we'll just kind of roll from there. And, and that is, and we were just talking about how busy everyone's calendars are. So one of the questions I like to ask is, you know, at a time where everyone has calendars that are super full and we're trying to juggle all of these things and we're, you know, meetings all day long. Why would someone want to take a, a half an hour, an hour out of their day and talk with Black Cloak? And then also um, tell us a little bit about like what, what was seen in the market that needed something like this, because I think this is something that's brand new. So Daniel, with that, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for that. So yeah, so um, kind of what Black Cloak is, is where we do digital executive protection. Uh, in a concierge way. Uh, so kind of the salesy, pitchy version of that is, is, is Black Cloak is a concierge cybersecurity and privacy platform for high net worth individuals, executives, senior leadership in their personal lives. Um, and that last part where I kind of pause on is important because we are not focused on the corporate network, the corporate devices, the corporate account. We're here to secure the other side. The other side of that that attack surface that's currently not being serviced, which is the personal devices of an individual or an executive, their spouses or the partner devices, their home network, their personal email accounts, their AOLs and Gmails and Yahoos and, and email accounts that they may have even forgot about, um, the dependent children, um, the whole other attack surface that currently, for numerous reasons, the corporate SOC can't protect. Um, whether it's license agreements, privacy agreements, um, numerous reasons that you wouldn't want your SOC protecting those personal devices, that's where Black Cloak comes in. So we're here to be the SOC for the individual, for the corporate executive, for their family and their home network. So to your original question on kind of why, why would you spend 30 minutes to an hour to talk to, to, to Black Cloak is, is the ROI on, on time spent, I think, would, is, is significant. So um, the question is, do you really want to have your SOC who's focused and sharpened their tools and their expertise protecting your corporate network? And that's where their skills lie. Um, do you want them also spending time helping out the CFO, the CEO, the CEO's partners, devices, questions around cybersecurity on Instagram, helping one of their kids get their Instagram um, account back or taking down uh, a fake um, Facebook profiled account that may have been set up in their account, something of that nature that we do kind of ad hoc, you know, so that's where, you know, we have a value add where you wouldn't have, you know, your SOC team handling things like that. So, so I think this is pretty fascinating because um, again, right. We, we we spend a lot of time talking about corporate networks and, and that sort of thing. And, and so this is different, I guess, talk to us a little bit about, like the the size of the issue. I, I mean, I think we understand that that high value folks have you know certainly a target on their on their back when it comes to what the attackers are doing. But talk to us a little bit about like what is the scope of that attack surface? Yeah, so I would say that you know um, it, it's pretty much anyone in a senior leadership position or anyone that has a, a position that, to have access to sensitive data. So um, you're talking about chief financial officer. Um, even a, uh, uh, someone that's you know in the accounting department that may have access to sensitive documents. What we see and what we know, even though we have rules in place where all of our documents and access are supposed to stay on our corporate devices, um, as everyone knows that that, uh, that rule isn't always followed. 
Um, sometimes these devices, um, sometimes these files get, at, get get transferred over to a personal device. Um, sometimes the or happened with COVID, these devices are in the home network. Um, you can protect the corporate network, but what are you doing for the home network? Um, have you pen tested it? Have you network scanned it? Um, what ports are exposed on the on the firewall? So from a scope perspective, it's literally anyone in the senior leadership team or anyone at the organization that an attacker would want to target. Um, you know the 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 you know the kind of cliche saying is the the weakest link in the fence is going to be your 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 strat your strength. So the the what, what we see actually is foreign adversaries EPTs are targeting executives in their personal lives to gain access to the corporate network. Uh, so they can pivot and get access in. Um, you know we have numerous clients who've had similar scenarios where their personal email addresses have been compromised. Um, and then they've used that to send a social media or not social media, sorry, social engineering attack against um, other members of their team to try to gain access. So um, the scope is large. Um, we have statistics on you know what we see when we onboard and from an engagement perspective, you know, from a personal cybersecurity perspective, um, the results are may not be surprising to us as security professionals, but you um, know, we have things like, you know, 70% of the executives that we onboard have exposed passwords um, in some type of data breach. Um, so we, we have, uh, you know, dark web tools and subscriptions that we apply to that will search through uh, their personal credentials, right? A lot of the companies are doing this on their corporate domain email address, but they're not covering the personal side, the at Gmail, the at Yahoo, the at AOL. Uh, and we're discovering that almost 70% have exposed passwords that are on the dark web. And as we know, nobody ever uses passwords, right? So a lot of times those passwords are the same passwords that you're using in the corporate network. So um, no, I a, think that's a good uh, that's a good segue to the how, right? So um, you guys are doing all these things and you mentioned a, a concierge service around it as well. Um, are you white labeling, you know, services that are already out in the um, in the market and, you know, just applying those and, and being the service around it, or do you have your own proprietary code and apps and scanners and things of that nature? Yeah. So that's a great question. So that, that, that was a challenge for us in the beginning of Black Cloak, right? So we're a platform, we're a product company. Um, we, we're not an MSSP, we're a product company and we've developed our own in-house technology. Um, and we've done that um, with the approach of attacking and protecting as much of the attack surface as possible, right? So there are a lot of companies out there that did offer multiple um, products in one segment, right? Like you have great companies like Palo Alto who make great firewalls. Um, you have other great companies who do great EDRs, great companies who make password managers, right? So what we've done is we take a blended approach where we've built our own security solution from the ground up using our own technology um, and where it made sense to build our own technology to protect a certain area of the attack surface, we did. Uh, example is our mobile app in the background. Or where it made sense that, um, you know, for example, EDR, that's a whole company in of itself, right? You can't be all things to all people. You can't be all things to all problems. So where it makes sense to bring in a best of breed technology, we'll white label or partner with, um, you know, uh, a Gartner Upright EDR, and we deploy that um, under the hood with our agent. Um, same thing with the password manager. Um, there's some great password managers out there. Um, no, there's no reason to make the 15th password manager out there. Um, so what we do is we, we train our people um, how to uh, you know, educate our consumer, our, our, our member base on how to use that password manager, how to set it up, how to get it moving and things like that. So it's a blended approach. Our platform has custom proprietary technology that we've built in on top of best of breed third party technologies that we integrate with. I think that's a great approach too, because like you said, there are great market leaders out there already. So why, you know, build something that you would have to compete with and, you know, spend the, spend the time, you know, trying to. Um, so specifically, you mentioned your, your mobile app, which is uh, custom built uh, from just from a, a perspective uh, of you know, where I'm working today, I get questions around, uh, and it's a it's, it's a bit of a hot topic and a buzzword in the industry, but Pegasus, right? Specifically, if we if you talk about mobile phone protection, somebody's going to bring up Pegasus. Um, can you briefly touch on you guys are looking for that? You guys can prevent it, et cetera, et cetera. 
Yeah, so that is a hot topic. Um, there's there's numerous points to, to to cover on that. One of them is, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, with the way the modern mobile operating systems are built, uh, and I won't name names um, or vendors, um, but they've severely limited the ability to monitor things that you could do on a computer. So what you can do on Mac OS on Windows with EDR, you know, injecting into processes, um, hooking into other APIs as far as Mac OS, right? That level of visibility and security that you can get from a third party application on a computer vastly differs from what you can do on a mobile operating system. And I think that's actually a, a huge hindrance um, in the industry. And I think that's a big problem that really should be addressed. Um, Right now, the only real way to detect Pegasus is either A, to do a full backup of your device and run it through some IoT tools like MBT looking for forensics artifacts, right? There's, that's not preventative. It doesn't proactively detect or stop the threat. You're going back in time to say, was I ever infected with Pegasus? And that's if you're lucky that it wasn't built, if, if it wasn't ran in a way that infected and then wiped itself and you never saw any artifacts to, to begin with, right? The other way is um, a little bit more nascent and what I'm seeing some of the, the, the larger EDR vendors are stepping into the space um, and some are saying that they can stop it by running a, a, a local VPN um, where all the traffic is supposed to go to the VPN and they, they have the known bad URLs or the host names or the IP addresses. But um, from what I've read about Pegasus and from what we've seen in the press is they're very adaptive. Um, they're very secretive. They're constantly changing their infrastructure. They're constantly changing their host names. And how do you really call out what's regular web traffic versus what's Pegasus traffic, especially when you can't do SSL decryption? Um, everything is cert penned. There's no SSL decryption in line. So you don't have a lot of visibility other than the host names and IP addresses of where the devices are going. So uh, at the end of the day, the only way that we're going to ever get proactive protection against something like advanced nation state Pegasus software is if the vendors open up the kernel or allow security vendors to hook in um, at a lower layer and do the things that they can do on the say a computer operating system. So uh, if if you have like a really savvy CIO, I mean, I know a few VPs that run significant home labs. Do you, you know, you talked about Mac OS and some of the endpoints. Do you support server endpoints as well? So uh, we, we support Mac OS and Windows in ios and android we do not really have or have we had a request for any servers like installing on ubuntu or things like that i think we had one member that ran linux on the desktop um, which actually our technology supports but at the time we didn't have um, enough procedures built around it to support it so we didn't actually install our agent on it um, so it's mostly uh, almost 100 percent of our client base is um, we'll say non-technical um, or somewhat technical and you know they're running the standard four operating systems so so to date we haven't had any requests to install on a, a server-based os so I'm, I'm an organization and and i'm interested and i want to you know protect my executives in this in the way you guys are talking about what does that look like operationally? Uh, like who who interfaces with the executives? Is the security team still involved? Um, can you kind of walk through what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So that's where the, the whole concierge part in the white glove approach um, that we take uh, comes into play. So we, we have a, um, a dedicated security operations center. So we have the SOC and we have a dedicated customer success team or client success team. Um, and the, the team operates um, together to deliver our service. So the SOC is receiving alerts from the field. These are either sensors deployed via agents on our um, endpoints of the um, clients, or you know we have our threat intel platform where we're constantly scanning um, IP addresses and email addresses for compromised credentials and things of that nature. That all feeds into the SOC, um, just like you would have at a corporate SOC, right? We, we, have, we use the same tools, same dashboards um, that you would see at a corporate SOP, a lot of the same processes. Uh, and then we almost treat the individual family like a company, right? So each family is its separate client account. And that's um, you know, how we'll, we'll interface with the clients. From a, um, a service delivery perspective, um, 
we'll communicate with them, you know, really via their preferred method of communication. So that's either via our app, via email, via text messaging, uh, or via phone calls. And it really depends on the severity of the alert. Why are, is it an outbound um, case where we're reaching out to them because we found something? Uh, or is it an inbound um, issue where it's something that they have a question about? So we have a concierge team that you can either schedule an appointment with us using a, a Calendly like tool. You can pick a date and time, find an available analyst. You can call in um, and get support, uh, or you can email into our uh, uh, client success team and you know, um, it'll generate a ticket and you know it, someone will reach back out you know with a pretty short sla so um so standard hiring, very white yeah no i was just gonna say so if i'm hiring you guys to to, per, to protect my executives uh home uh information then i'm taking that off of like i don't need my own sock to do that there's is there is there interactions there or you guys are pretty much just dealing directly with uh, uh with the executive folks Yes, yeah, so that's a really good question, and we get that a lot in, in a lot of the um, sales calls that we do. So the, the question really comes is, is what, what does the relationship look like um, from us as a business entity and then also from our executives, right? And we have to walk a very fine line of privacy. So I guess the best kind of analogy that we make is employer-provided health care, right? The employer provides the health care, but the health care relationship is really between the doctor and the patient, which is, we'll call it the executive, for example, right? So the employer doesn't get involved with the, uh, you know, diagnoses or the prescriptions or any of that nature. Like all that stuff's confidential between the doctor and the patient, um, which is executive. The employer is just providing the service. Okay. So that's our that's my best analogy of how it works, with a caveat. So um, we do we do actually have, with the executive's permission, um, if it's a attack from say an APT or a known threat actor, where we can determine that. It's a personal device. It's being monitored by Black Cloak or, or some other, you know, type of, you know, system or account. And it looks like this was a pivoting attack or attempt. They're coming after the corporate network through this personal device. So um, if the right, you know, rules are set up in place and, and everyone agrees to it, we'll actually partner with the SOC um, and we'll reach out based on rules in our CRM and say, okay, we need to get a hold of. Um, this distribution list or this uh, phone number and share these IOCs with them to let them know that the uh, attackers are coming through to see whoever, oh, um, this is the IOCs we saw. Here's what to be on the lookout for. So we do in that case, um, you know, in, a very, in those extreme cases, we do actually have agreements in place with some of our uh, organizations that we cover to do just that. Okay. I think that's perfect. I, yeah. An IOC indicator of compromise. Oh, we yes. have, you know, no acronyms, real. <laughs> My bad. Sorry. I will, I will stay away from the acronyms. Okay, we'll use them too, and you can call us out on it. So right. you, uh, you had mentioned that, you know, you're protecting, you know, multiple aspects from home networks to personal devices, and we've touched on, on um, you know, uh, personal devices a bit. Um, how are you guys doing, you know, IoT, the, the home network? you know, if somebody plugs something in that they shouldn't be or, you know, kids trying to connect or whatever. Um, do you guys touch on that at all or what's your uh, solution yeah. for that? Yeah, so the, the, the home network is, a, is an interesting approach. So the way we do things today, um, you know, we have stuff on the roadmap, but obviously you know, I'll talk about what we can do today, um, is we're doing it what I call an outside-in pen test of the public IP. Um, that's coming from our cloud infrastructure to the public IP of the home, and our homes, and due to the nature of our clients, um, you know, most of them are high net worth, ultra high net worth, um, corporate executives, things like that. The homes are usually pretty elaborate. Um, these are homes that we see that have, you know, a Cisco UCS system, um, 15 access points, um, 48 port PoE switches, you know, 15 cameras, um, you know, I literally a, 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 a smart piano. Um, we actually compromised once, which was amazing to me. I didn't even know they made a smart piano. So, um, you know, due to the type of, of home the devices that are in the home network and the way they're set up, most of the time these home networks are not set up by the homeowner um, or, or our client. They're set up by an IT firm or an audiovisual company. Uh, and what we've discovered is um, they will port forward on the firewall because they don't want to forward, you know, they don't want to roll a truck every time there's a call. Unfortunately, they do this very insecurely. They're not security experts. They're not cybersecurity experts. So what we've discovered and what ha happens very often is when we do our, our pen test engagement, 
and we scan the, the network perimeter on that public IP, we find camera systems, home theater automation systems, um, routers, VPNs that have either default credentials, no credentials, um, vulnerabilities from five or six years ago, um, all the time. Um, and then we actually engage in a full red team exercise. So we'll go from enumeration and vulnerability scanning, um, and then the pen test team will actually do a full pen test up to the point of full exploitation. Um, and then if we actually gain access to the internal network, uh, like we just recently did on an, on an engagement, we'll actually continue to go forward just like an attacker would on the internal network. Um, so um, think about it as a full red team exercise. Um, and then we'll do that scanning weekly. So we're weekly scanning those IPs to make sure that a new port didn't pop up that we didn't catch before. And then doing the more traditional stuff like, hey, there was a, uh, and I won't name names, but a, a vendor firewall that really recently, you know, when you scanned it initially, it didn't have a vulnerability, but now it has a vulnerability. Uh, we'll go back and as part of our CMS database, we'll say, oh, you know, this device is now vulnerable. Right. Let's go see if it is vulnerable and then alert. Um, and then lastly on that, is where, um, where we have to go kind of the extra mile is we can't then gener generate a pen test report and then hand it to the to the client who's gonna look at it and say, what's a CVE, right? Like, wh wh what's TCP 6084? So what we do is we actually, you know, in kind of more common layman's term, explain the vulnerability. You have a camera system, it's exposed to the internet. Everyone can see it by default credentials and the last 90 days of footage. This is really bad. Um, let us, put us in touch if you authorize this to work with your IT company, your AV provider, and we'll reach out with them in a very non-blaming, non-shaming way um, and help them fix the problem. Um, let them kind of tell them what the problem is, show them how to fix it. They'll go fix it, and then we'll retest to ensure that the, the vulnerability has been mitigated. Um, oftentimes, these AV companies are very thankful. Um, they actually say, oh, I have 10 other clients with the same router at their home that's vulnerable. Thank you for you know educating us. So if you, if you do it with the right approach, and you don't go in shaming and blaming and trying to make them feel stupid. Um, they're usually thankful and you know everybody's happy and at the end of the day, the client's more secure and they've learned something as well. So yeah, that's awesome. What uh so tell me about the team, the SOC. Uh, you know, you mentioned it's 24-7, very white glove. Um, are they all black coat employees? Do you have, you know, do you contract with another call center? Um, are you follow the sun, like, or do you actually have people around the world, you know, can explain that? Yeah, so, so, so today it's all U.S. based. Um, we have, we have really kind of two, two call vectors, I would call it, right? So we have our standard concierge hours that are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and then if you're on the, the principal plan, which is a higher plan, you also get weekend support um, 8 to 6 on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and that's for standard stuff. Hey, uh. My, my Wi-Fi, my basement's crap. I heard about mesh networking. What do you guys recommend, right? That's the more concierge. Get an analyst on a phone. Ask a simple question. Um, you know, help me with this account issue. I have a new device. Let's get it enrolled. Things like that. Then there's the, you know, actual sock stuff, right? So uh, if you're getting hacked or there's an active event and it's 8 or 1 p.m. on a Friday, we're not going to say, hey, too bad, call us back on Monday, right? Like we're, we're going to engage our IR process and immediately spin up incident response. Uh, we're going to gauge the on-call person, um, and then we have people spread throughout, you know, the, the four time zones in the U.S. to get as much coverage as possible. And then we have after-hours rotation, right? So if something comes in, um, we'll 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 hop on it, and it's you know treated just like any event, like a, an actual sock would. So, um, so, from, so it's from a, a it's high a, level. Do, do you have are there tiers to that support? So you know, is there like level one, level two, level like absolutely amazing, or is it just one package? Yeah, so it's great. Uh, well, I'll say when you say level, do you mean like the level of um, support professionals or do you mean like the level of packages that we sell? Yeah, a little bit of both. So it's like, you know, tier one, two, three. Can I like buy a package to go right to tier three? So, you know, I get that immediate like super white glove support or is it just one model for everybody where it's just like this is the support you get? You know, you mentioned, you know, some of that, how the rotations work for on call. Um, break that down a little bit. Yeah, so all of the all three packages that we sell, all of them have the same support um, level. We'll call it right. Um, the good thing about the team is um, everyone on the team is is pretty skilled in being able to handle the call. In fact, we say that you know more than ninety percent of the time, the first person you talk to is going to be the one that can solve your problem, right? So we have our security analysts um, are, are also going to be handling the security calls. 
So they're likely going to be able to solve your problem on that call. Um, and just like our client success team, they're very technology focused and skilled. Um, in fact, if you Venn diagram the two separate teams from a skill set perspective, there there's a lot of overlap, right? So um, so what we try to do is when we get an incoming request, um, we'll we'll route it based on the the topic to the right person. So you don't call in and say, okay, we're going to escalate your ticket, and then you have two days of emails going back and forth, and then it goes to tier two or tier three. We don't have a tiered system. It's one system. We have you know two teams, and depending on what the t t the, the topic of the ticket it, ticket is, it'll get routed to either one of those two teams. Um, so it's we have very short SLAs, um, and our turnaround time on you know solving these issues is pretty short. And it's all our people, all U.S. based. Um, we don't offshore or outsource any of the um, any of the um, client success or security operations team. So I'm a, I'm curious about the the sales process, just because again, this is such a different um, take. So Todd, maybe you can even chime in here. Like, who are the folks that you're typically interacting with at the beginning of the sales process? Like, are, are you talking with security um, managers, directors? Are you, you know, like who is who are the folks that are interested in doing this? Does it start at the executives, or where do you guys typically go from a sales standpoint? Uh, it's up and down the ladder. Um, I've begun conversations <clears throat> anywhere from an analyst who, you know, has been tasked to reach out and learn more about executive protection. Um, a lot of times, well, over the last three weeks, especially, I've been at a bunch of trade shows where the analysts will come by, swing by, hey, what's Black Cloak? There's CISOs roaming around there, hanging out, just, you know, not wanting to get badgered too much, but they'll report back to them. <clears throat> and they'll come up and say, hey, really interested in what you're doing. This is kind of, it's been a topic. We want to talk more. So um, everywhere up from the CISO, but then we also get a lot of outreach from the legal department. Um, you know, with if you think about cyber insurance, it's something that hasn't really been addressed that we've heard, but with, with uh, the premiums going up yearly, you know, they're always looking for ways to say, hey, you know, this is what we're doing internally. Here's some things that we're doing externally. And then we also have um, executives who will reach out you know, that maybe they've done some of their own research. And, you know, just because of, you know, how Daniel mentioned earlier, they're high, you know, they're high net worth, net worth individual. Um, they are looking for their own personal sec uh, security. That being said, we have another side of the business that we haven't talked about. You know, I, I handle the B2B side, um, but we also have a high net worth individual side. Uh, if you think celebrities, actors, sports stars, you know, we have a whole side of the business dedicated to that. So they can reach out directly. Um, you know, whether it's a family office or a wealth management company. So, you know, really a variety of ways, but, you know, folks on the corporate side, it's especially becoming more of a topic. And it's kind of fun when we go someplace and they're like, hey, this is something new. This isn't another EDR. This isn't another, you know, something solution that we've seen and we're trying to narrow it down. You know, it's really the only player in the game. So then is there... You know, I'm just I'm just trying to matching it up to like how we see a typical sales process happen. Is there is there a, a POC or are there any sort of evaluations that that can be done for for these folks? We have a couple of ways to go about that. Um, a POC is tough because you know we're not going to plug in your system, and you know there's not a measurable goal. Right, right. Internally, so what we do is typically what we offer is say, hey, why don't you do you know, purchase three trial license, get your top two executives covered, your CEO, CFO, you know, whoever you want to cover. And then somebody from your security team who can really understand what's going on and be an advocate to take that back to the leadership. Um, you know, as far as a POC, I mean, we are getting that question more. So, you know, we really are kind of relying on putting the metrics in place. What do you want to see? So we're going to protect um, your devices. Okay, what, what does that mean to you? We're going to protect their home. You know, what, what do you want to see out of that? The other thing we all say is we protect their privacy. We, I don't know if Danny touched on it yet, um, but, you know, we do dark web search. We do data broker removal. What do you want to see out of that? So we'll lay out those metrics. Tell us what you want to see, and we'll, we'll show you. So Yeah, that, that, that's a good segue, because that was an area that we really hadn't talked about much on the kind of the four key areas that we cover is privacy, devices, home and peace of mind. And the peace of mind is really that concierge piece to it. But um, because of there, there's a lot of front-ended loaded, the front-loaded stuff that we do to spin up account. 
Um, so it's a little um, cost intensive because we're doing data broker removal. We're doing deep web, dark web scanning. Um, we're doing those those home network scans. So um, POCs are a little bit more different than say if you just were trialing a piece of software for us. But we do have some avenues where you can try it before you buy it because you know obviously you know most people don't want to just jump in and you know sign a, a big contract right off the bat. They'll want to see uh, you know see how the tool works. We also have another um, what we call mock onboarding where we can show the CISO or the CTO or, or you know whoever's the um, the the lead or the the champion of the deal what the executive is going to experience like what is what's it going to look like when they they get onboarded and what will the service look like as well so we have we have several avenues where we can achieve um, you know that's that similar concept to a POC and, and Matt to your point what I, what I typically suggest you know after that initial engagement I'll say hey let's do a technology call I'll bring on Danny or somebody from our sale or from our security team we get an NDA in place, then we can show you under the hood, talk about some of the, those products that we have and what we're doing and how we do it. And then, you know, as Daniel mentioned, we'll do that mock onboarding where you can meet the client success team. You can, you know, they can either walk you through an onboarding yourself or they take you through the process or just give you a high level overview. Because the more knowledge you have, when you go back to your executives, when you say, hey, there's a service out there, we've done this vetting, um, it's got really great tools. You know, this is a service that we want to, put for you so that you're protected there so you know those are really that's how i i like to work through the system yeah um yeah this is fascinating um which i think i've said three times now i should come up with a new word but it is very interesting just because i think again it's a bit you know it is a different a different take on on very important piece of security that maybe folks are not thinking about so if i'm if i'm an executive and and i've onboarded and i've got you know, children and, and all of these things, like how, how much, uh, interaction do I have to have, or like, right. Like, like how much, you know, we say static or whatever in the sock, but like how much of that is, is going on here? Cause you know, like maybe I'm not a technology savvy, uh, executive, but I still want to have this, um, uh, Daniel, maybe talk a little bit more about like, like my kid just got a new iPad. What do I, you know, like what interaction am I, am I having with Black Cloak? And, and so if I can add on to that real quick, um, like the safe browsing thing, Matt. So not only that, but like, do you also cover cover my kids for, you know, safe browsing? Do you block things? Yeah. So so to, to that question, um, we're not in line. So we're not URL filtering. We're not do we're not Zscaler or WebSense. Um, and that's intentional. Uh, in fact, our EDR is even tuned to not record DNS lookups. Um, and that's for privacy reasons. Um, we don't wanna know what websites you're going to. We don't wanna know what apps are installed on your phone. Those are very privacy, um, personal things, nor do we really need to. Do we lose a little bit of visibility from a forensics perspective? Yes, um, but it's worth it because at the end of the day, we, we, we're more um, you know, process focused when it comes from an EDR perspective is Chrome.exe doesn't care what website you came from. If it downloaded an Excel.xlsx, which then was opened and launched PowerShell and then decoded a base64 code and payloaded and reached out to an IP, right? Like at the end of the day, what, it doesn't matter what website you were visiting, all of those behavioral patterns are the reason that we should stop this and it should be a threat, it should be alerted. So, so we're not in line, um, but we do however have, um, when we do the onboarding, um, a lot of times we'll do it with the family and there's an educational piece to it and we call this device hardening. And we'll go through, um, especially on the mobile devices, and we'll say, all right, you have these 82 apps installed. Do you really need to share your location services with all of them? Um, you know, and we have you know, a numerous checklist of things that we'll go through. And it's not a, we press a button and we force you to all, all these things you with like an MDM. In fact, our solution doesn't need MDM rights because it would conflict with other um, uh, corporate executives that have MDM. So um, we'll go through the, the, the settings and say, Here's why you would want this off. Here's the repercussions of turning it off. Uh, we recommend you turn it off, but it's up to you to turn it on or off. We educate. Um, and it's really about educating. So it's educating parents, um, but it's also educating the kids on kind of smart decisions to make online, things not to share, um, password hygiene, MFA, um, you know, avoiding, you know, you know, doing certain things online and stuff like that. So there's an educational portion to the concierge piece of our offering where um, we're, we're, you know, not everything can be solved through a technology app, you know, hardware. 
or, or piece of software. Some of it really just comes down to education. So in that area, we have a, um, you know, we have a pretty um, robust knowledge base and the team's pretty skilled in educating the team on, um, you know, what exactly are those things to look out for. Um, the camera's doing the witness protection thing. <laughs> I knew it was going to do it. <laughs> the cloak, the cloak. So. There we go. Yeah, I got cloaked. <laughs> All right. Um, well, uh, Todd, Dan, Daniel, this was a, uh, I've learned some stuff today, uh, guys. One, I need to look up some synonyms to the word fascinating, but um, I appreciate this conversation. This was super interesting. I, you know, I, I if, if you're a, an organization that's out there and you're worried about what's happening, uh, you know, inside your executive's homes from a security perspective, right? And, and understanding that that is another attack vector into your organization, um, then reach out to Black Cloak. Uh, all their information is down here in the description below and, and uh, uh, talk to them and, and see what they can do for you. Um, really cool stuff. Uh, I, I, uh, I appreciate you guys being a part of this. And um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see every... Uh, I almost forgot we got to do the please like subscribe and do all of that fun stuff uh, as well because this is YouTube and that's what you have to do. Um, so uh, everyone, thanks. I appreciate it. And uh, uh, everyone watching and we'll see you for episode 32. Thanks.